So now we're going to shift gears and talk about endogeneity in structural models and really endogeneity in this kind of discrete choice structural models that we've been talking about all, all semester. So, so far, we have mostly assumed that we just have exogenous explanatory variables. Uh, when we talked about GMM, we did kind of talk about using, uh, incorporating instruments, but, but we didn't really say a whole lot about why we would actually want to do that. And now we're going to say more about it. So why is this idea of exogeneity or endogeneity so important? Well, we need exogenous variation in our explanatory variables in order to give our parameter estimates the kind of causal interpretation that we want to give them. And I put causal in quotes here because this isn't causal inference in the same way that most people use the term causal inference. Um, but when we kind of define our structural parameters in our model, we have some idea in mind that we're thinking about how shifting around our data changes something like utility. And so it's causal in that sense, even though it's not something that's kind of like truly causal inference in the way that we typically mean it in kind of like an OLS setting. So to say, maybe to say a few more words about this, you know, if our data are endogenous, then our parameters can be interpreted as a kind of correlation between data and choices. It's going through this nonlinear model. So it's not even a, just a, a direct correlation, but we can think of it as a kind of correlation. But if there's kind of simultaneity or, or some other source of endogeneity that, that, that's going into that estimation, then those parameters are not going to be the true structural parameters that we intend to estimate. If we want to estimate some marginal utility parameters, we're thinking about how does shifting the data affect utility. But if that kind of, if the direction of that effect is in both ways, then all of a sudden our parameter isn't going to have just kind of the unidirectional interpretation that we want to give it. The problem though, is that in most cases, real exogenous variation in, in kind of important explanatory variables is often difficult to come by. So let's look at some examples. We, we talked about commuting a lot in this class. Uh, let's think about housing choice and commuting choice. Those are typically correlated. People who like public transit are going to tend to live closer to transit stations, bus stops, tr train stations, whatever the case might be. And that's gonna make their transit travel time lower. But that's not exogenously lower, that's endogenously lower because they like transit. So we're gonna see people who like transit and take transit have lower transit times. And that's gonna essentially bias upward any kind of coefficient that we would put on transit travel time. It's gonna make it look like transit travel time is really important to their decision. When in reality, part of that correlation is that their decision affected the transit travel time and not the opposite. In a lot of IO applications, we run into this case where price and unobserved quality of a product, again, unobserved to the econometrician, those are correlated. So products with higher unobserved to the econometrician quality tend to cost more but they're also preferred by consumers. We might not be able to see that quality, but consumers can. And if that's correlated with price, then we can end up with the coefficient on price being biased downward in absolute value, biased downward, and may even have the wrong sign. We generally, I mean, demand curves are downward sloping. So prices should have a negative effect on, uh, on consumption. But if that price is correlated with quality that we don't see, then it could actually be that people prefer products with higher prices, not because they like the higher price, but the higher price is correlated with quality that we don't see. And so we're going to get potentially the completely wrong sign in that kind of estimation. Another example is, is thinking about some kind of unobserved marketing campaign. If we're thinking about once again IO marketing something along those lines um, that can lead to correlations with price. Um, large marketing campaigns may be accompanied by sales or maybe if large marketing campaigns increase demand for a product in kind of a long-run equilibrium they actually lead to increased prices. So price could go up or down it could be positively or negatively correlated with something like advertising. Um, in that case 
our coefficient on price will be biased, but we won't even know the direction if we don't know whether that ad campaign was accompanied by sales or by kind of long run increases in prices. So uh, in some cases we might be able to think about kind of putting a, you know, a, a bound or, or a direction on the bias, but in some cases we'll just have no clue, but we'll know that our, our answers are probably wrong, but not even know which direction they're wrong in. So that sounds like a big concern. How do we estimate parameters with this kind of causal? And again, I'm putting causal in quotes here with this kind of causal interpretation. Maybe I should just say the correct interpretation. Well, we're gonna talk about two things in the next two videos. We're gonna talk about BLP estimation where we can use instruments to isolate exogenous variation and explanatory variables. And then we're gonna talk about control function estimation where we use instruments to control for endogeneity in our explanatory variables. But in both cases here, we're gonna to have to use instruments. And so let's say, let's talk first about what makes a good instrument. Well, a good instrument in our setting is gonna be exactly the same as a good instrument in kind of an OLS model that you might be more used to. It's gonna be a variable that's correlated with explanatory variables, but that is exogenous. Or in our case, what we mean by exogenous is uncorrelated with that random unobserved utility term. So we need, we need both, of these, both of these properties to be satisfied for a good instrument. And where do we get good instruments? Uh, uh, I, I used to have a professor who talked about going to the instrument store to find the instruments, but unfortunately it's not actually that easy. Um, but it's basically the same concept as just thinking through good research design in a reduced form analysis that you might be more used to at this point. Um, knowing things like institutional knowledge. Is there kind of some kind of natural experiment that you could, you could rely on? Um, are there exogenous policy shocks? Are there... Uh, you know, kind of any kind of, uh, if we're thinking about the product side, what could be possible exogenous things that would shift prices or costs of production? Um, and that might require, you know, digging into the details of specific industries that you're interested in, just understanding everything that, that, that's going into your model, um, not just from an economic standpoint, but from a real kind of institutional standpoint as well. Um, so I don't have a great answer for where we get good instruments because it's going to depend on what you're looking at and, and, and what, what makes a good instrument is going to really be context specific. And so that's why I think uh, the only advice I can give is to really know your context and understand where might some exogeneity come from in that specific context. So I'm going to stop there on the overview and dive into BLP estimation in the next video.